All right, welcome back, everybody. We had a great weekend. So today we're going to continue talking about some of the basics of what makes computers so useful and powerful and so exciting to be able to learn how to use and how to program, how to get to do our bidding. So last time we talked a little bit about how we store information in our computer program. All right, we talked about variables, in the Java programming language, we talked about some different types of variables that we can use that might be useful in our programs to store single pieces of information or single pieces of data that we're gonna use. And then today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna continue on by talking a little bit about how we can actually make use of some of that data. One of the things that we can do with data is use it to make decisions. That's one of the other things that computers are good at. And we're gonna start looking at constructs in the Java programming language for making decisions in our program about whether to do one thing or another thing. All right, so just a quick review from last time. We introduced Java's eight primitive types. These are the basic building blocks of all of the more complex data structures and different ways of storing information that we will talk about later in the class. But to begin with, we're starting with the basics. And these are the sort of atoms in terms of data in the Java programming language. These are things that you can't break down any further. So there were four different ways to store integers, four different types in Java for storing integers that differ in terms of the number of different integers that we can store in them. So we had uh, bytes, shorts, ints, and longs. We had two different types of floating point numbers. In computer science, a floating point number is a number that has a decimal component. So this allows us to store uh, numbers that have fractional components to them, as opposed to just whole numbers. And then there were two other uh, types that we had to round out our list of eight. We had a way of storing characters that we will soon learn how to build into a way of storing lists of characters or strings or text, as you know it. And that's a really important form of data that's generated by humans all the time. And then finally, one that's important to our conversation today is this Boolean value or truth value, which describes whether or not something is true or false. And this is gonna be the building block for our discussion of how computers make decisions. Because essentially the way computers make decisions is they reduce more complicated expressions into true or false values and then use them to decide whether or not to do one thing or not, or to do one thing or to do another thing. All right, we talked a little bit at the end about why we have these different numeric types. And this is essentially, these types allow us to store different amounts of information. So I can store a larger number of integers in an int type than in a short type. A larger number of integers in a short type than in a byte type. Now there's a trade-off here, as you might expect. And the trade-off is that as I store more data, my information is taken up more of the computer's memory. And this is not something that's gonna concern us right now, but this is the reason why Java has these different types. If you work in more, um, more modern, I shouldn't say more modern, languages that have been uh, uh, used more recently, like Python, Python just doesn't care. Python's like, Python stores every number in your program is a very, very big piece of memory, so that it could uh, store a lot of precision about that number. So that's just a trade-off that Python made, it said, you know what, people have more memory on their machines than they used to, let's forget about all this, okay? And we're gonna largely forget about it too, except for stuff like this, right? So we went through this fun example last time where, you know, if you want to impress your friends by computers, um, math making, or uh, math struggles, you can show them this example. Somebody asked about this on the forum, and I think that Ben had one of the best answers, which he said, you know, think about this like a clock, right? So the byte type is like a clock that only has 256 positions. So if you add 256 to a number that's stored as a byte, what's gonna happen is that you're gonna wrap around and you're gonna end up where you start. All right? If you need to look up information about these types, again, you can do this online as part of the Java documentation. Um, the, so let's go back and review just a little bit about why we use types in the first place, though. Right? Because again, if you're coming from a language like Python, I think this is worth reiterating. So not only do types sort of force you to tell Java a little bit about how much information you need about that integer, which allows it to um, use memory more efficiently, but the real reason to use types as a program, 
I mean, on some level, when you guys are getting started, don't worry about how much memory your program takes. If it's correct, it's correct, right? If it runs properly, you know, computers now have so much more memory than they did when I was a kid, right? It's, it's staggering, right? Um, but the real reason to use types in your programming language, this is why Java supports them, is that they actually allow you to catch many common programming mistakes. And this is one of the reasons, this is a trade-off that you make in language design. A language like Python, which some of you are familiar with, doesn't really force, doesn't have these restrictions. It doesn't check the types of your program for you. Java will do this. So Java will notice if you've told it that a particular variable is going to be used to store a character, and then you try to store a floating point number in it. Then it's going to catch that for you and complain. Because usually, that indicates a problem with your program. In Python, you can just do that, and Python won't care. And if it indicates a problem in your program, you're going to have to hope that you can find that problem in some other way. All right. Now, in this course, I just want to point out, um, we're going to basically use four of these types. We're going to use characters. We're going to use Booleans. Um, but for integers and floating points, typically we're going to use ints for storing integer values, particularly in the playground examples. Um, and we will use doubles for storing floating point values. These types are sufficient for our purposes, um, and they're, they'll do just fine. At some point, if you're writing you know, a program and you, you know, gotten more sophisticated and you've started to worry a little bit more about memory or precision, you might go back and revisit these decisions. But for our purposes, when we're working with integers, we're going to use the int type. When we're working with uh, numbers that have a decimal point component, we'll use the double type to store those values. And then Booleans and characters, right? All right, any questions about this before we go on? Questions about variables, types, any of this stuff? I know we talked about it so long ago, last Friday. Um, OK, let's go on. One thing I want to point out, you know, in terms of the structure of this class is that, you know, I have so, we, you have so much support behind you that, you know, you can make this journey until May. You can make it. You know, some of you may be a little uh, disoriented, a little bewildered. You may feel a little lost already. Uh, but look, I've got hundreds of course staff that really want to help you with this. They're here to help because they understand how valuable it is to get to where you're going. All right? Um, so please, and we have office hours that start today from 12 to 4. We have people on the forum that are like desperate to help students. You know, a few of you have uh, posted in our help, to our help group, and you know, some of my core staff are laughing. They're like, you know, the, the CAs are so excited that they're like all jumping on these threads and all trying to reply at once, right? Um, you know, we have resources available for you. So if you're struggling, please come ask for help, right? Um, you know, if you come into office hours today from 12 to 4, maybe you haven't started the homework yet, maybe you've been a little intimidated. Um, you know, maybe some of the concepts, you know, because like I said, the homework are, are a little bit out of order. Basically, today, we're kind of catching up to where the homework is. By the end of class today, you should know enough to complete all the homeworks that are available. If you haven't gotten started on those, and I know a lot of you haven't, right? I know how many people have done the homework problems. Come today between 12 and 4. There will be CAs there to help you, and we'll get you turned around and, and started right, right? But again, we have all of these resources, so please come and make Take advantage of them. Ask on the forum. Come to office hours. No question is too dumb. Um, and giving up is the only way that you guys will fail at this class. All right? OK, so now let's go back to talking about what we can do with computers, what makes them so exciting to you. So we've essentially crossed off a couple of these items from our list, right? Uh, we've talked about basic math and storing data. Did that last time. So now we're going to talk today about simple decision making. How do we build uh, computer programs that use data to make decisions about what to do? And the building blocks I'm going to show you today are essentially the building blocks of all programmatic decision making. So if you're listening to like some auto-generated playlist on Spotify, and it goes to the next song, there's a decision that the computer is making about what song should I play for this person, given all of the information that they've uh, all the information it has about you, the songs you've liked in the past, blah, blah, blah. All of that is based on these building blocks, OK? It's not that simple. It involves a lot of these type of calculations. But this is all there is to it, 
is this type of simple decision making. And then again, sort of uh, that type of decision making spread over lots and lots and lots of data in, in a more interesting way. All right. So here's, here's where we're going to start. Right? So last time we talked about we can assign values to variables. Uh, we can change those variables. We can modify the values that variables have in ways like dividing them by numbers or adding numbers or mul uh, multiplying two variables together. Okay? Java also includes a variety of different operators that allow you to compare variables to each other or to literal values. These comparison operators return, or they, what they produce, is a Boolean value, a true or a false. And that Boolean value then becomes the basis for using conditional expressions, which we're going to talk about a little later in the class. All right? So let's look at some of these to begin with. Okay. So what's happening here in my, in my little program? We're going to try out a couple of these comparison, uh, these, these operators. All right, so I've got a variable here called tester that I'm declaring and initializing on line two. So remember, I can do that in a single statement. Um, I'm assigning it the value 10 to start with, okay? Um, so once I get to line four, Java knows that there's a variable called tester that exists in my program. Its type is int, which means I can store whole numbers in it. Um, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out, so I've got this magic statement I use to print something to the console to display it so that I can see it. And inside this print statement, I have something that's called a Boolean or a conditional state, uh, a conditional expression, okay? I get these mixed up sometimes, okay? Conditional expression, all right? So, and we're gonna go through the different ones that I have in Java, but who can guess what this is testing, right? So remember, these are about making decisions so this is going to produce a Boolean value, either true or false. What do you think that this particular, um, this double equals, is testing? Equality, exactly. So this is saying print off whether or not the value of tester at this point in the program is equal to a literal value, 10. So let's run this and see what happens. When you guys are doing these playground examples, it's always great to make a prediction in your head about what you're going to see on the screen before you run it, and then see if your prediction was correct. Okay, here it's true, because at that point in the program, tester does contain the value 10. Let's change that. Let's initialize tester to 11, and now we see that the value false is printed, okay? So I've got a variety of these, right? Let's try this guy. Um, actually, Jeff, you have to do it correctly. Uh. There we go. Anyone want to guess? So again, you can just play with these and find out what they do by induction. But what do you think? Anyone want to guess what this means? This little, yeah. Difference? Okay, uh, so, so finish that thought. What? what? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's an interesting way of saying it. Uh, sometimes we would say, is it not equal to 10? But that's a fine way of saying, is it different than 10? Is its value not 10? Right? So what do we think this is going to print? Tester, I assign tester the value 11 on line 2. This is true. The tester is not equal to 10. If I change this to 11, now it's going to say false. Because the one I'm testing here is tester not equal to 11, and it is equal to 11. All right? So let's try some of these other ones, right? I mean, I think you're probably getting the hang of this by now. What about this? You want to take a guess? What does this look like? Again, we're going back to algebra, basic math, high school. You know, we're kind of using the basic, oh, hello. Hold on a sec. Let me see if I can get this to come back. Uh, all right. Apologies for this. Hopefully, we'll be back in a second. Right. And. <laughs> My 
wife was just asking this morning, like, is all your tech for class working? And I was like, so far. So anyway, she jinxed me. Um, all right, so let's go back. We were looking at uh, this guy, right? Who, th who thinks they can guess what this is? Yeah, yeah, less than. So this looks like some type of less than. So let's play with it a little bit and see if we can figure out exactly, um, exactly, okay, so that's false. So 11 is not less than 10, okay? Now, let's try this, okay? So again, 11 is not less than itself. So this is strictly less than. The value on the right, my literal in this case, has to be strictly greater than 11. In this case, the value is 12. Okay. If I want to test whether or not a value is less than or equal to, I have an operator for that. It looks like this. So now if you look at it compared with 11, this will be true because 11 is less than or equal to 11, but this will be false because less than is not, 11 is not. Okay. I've got greater than, I have the equivalent of these for, um, for greater than, so is tester greater than or equal to 10? It is. Is it greater than or equal to 11? It is. Is it just strictly greater than 11? It's not. Okay. So again, what you're seeing here is how Java is taking this conditional expression. It's a statement about the truth, a relationship between two values. In this case, it's a variable and a literal, but it can also be two variables. We'll see some other examples of this in a minute. And it's reducing that to a Boolean value, one of true or false. And then again, in a minute, we'll see the Java constructs for using that Boolean value to make a decision about what part of the program should execute. All right. So this is a very, very common mistake when you're learning how to program, when you're getting started using a language like Java, is to confuse these two um, things, okay? So, and, and this is confusing because of how equ the equal sign is being used. So the first one, this is assignment. A single equal sign is assignment. That is changing the value of a variable or setting the value of a variable to something. This is an equality, uh, this is a conditional expression. So this reduces to a true or a false. The thing on top changes the value of A. The thing on the bottom compares the value of A with some other, um, checks whether or not it's equal to something else, okay? Happily, some of you guys have started to tangle with our source code formatting tool that we run on your submissions for the homework. We also run it on the submissions for the slide tool, and check style will warn you about this. So you'll see here, when we try to run this piece of code, the error that we're gonna get on line five is that inner assignments should be avoided. And the reason is that inside my print statement, I'm actually not testing whether or not tester is equal to five, I'm assigning it to five, right? So either I need to move this outside of my conditional. If I really want to change the value of tester, I can do it this way. Or I need to change the thing inside my print statement to be a conditional expression using a double equals to check for equal. Questions about this before we go on? Okay, good. So. We can also compare, like I said, the values of two variables. We don't have to compare a variable and a literal. We can compare the values of two variables. So here, um, I'm comparing whether or not first is greater than first. This comparison will always be false, no matter what the value of first is, because a value is never greater than itself, strictly greater. If I change this to greater than or equal to, it would always be true, because the two will always be true, and so will satisfy the conditional but I can use any combination of variable on the left side. Well, the thing on the left side always has to be a variable. But, well, actually, that's not true either. It can be any, either side can be either a variable or a literal. Typically, what you'll see is if I'm comparing uh, a variable and a literal, I put the literal on the right. But there's no rule that says that has to be the case. I can put it over here, I think. Let's see if check style will let me get away with this. Yeah, it will, okay. So you can write this in whatever way is more clear in your program. What you don't typically see is something like this. 
right? Because I don't need a, com you know, I don't need the, the computer doesn't need to run in order to evaluate this statement, right? When I compare two literals, either it's always true or always false, and so I would just replace that with true or false, right? I can do this, and Java will happily uh, uh, perform the comparison for me, but you don't see this in code, right? Because it, it's never going to change. Okay. As, let's look at a little bit more of a complex comparison. So I can compare the result of doing some combination of variables using some of the operators that we talked about last time. So now what's happening on line four, so on line two I'm declaring and initializing a variable called first of type int and I'm initializing it to 10, I'm assigning an initial value of 10. On line three I'm creating a variable called second, I'm assigning it an initial value of 20, it's also of type int. And now what I'm doing is this statement is, I'm, I'm evaluating the truth of this statement. So the statement says, is first plus second equal to 30? And so when Java evaluates this, it's gonna do the following. It's gonna say, okay, well, what's the current value of first, which is 10? It says, okay, what's the current value of second? That's 20. I'm gonna add those two together to get 30, and then I'm gonna say, is 30 equal to 30? Yes, that's gonna be true. Let's look at line five. So now again, first is 10. I'm gonna subtract the value of second. So that's gonna be 10 minus 20, which is gonna give me negative 10. Is that less than or equal to 10? It is. So these are both gonna be true. And let's see here, if I switch these around, let's say I say second is less than minus first, that's also 10. If I change this sound here to be a single, uh, a strict less than, it's false, because 10 is not less than 10, right? So, you know, the, the trick to evaluating these is to look for the comparison operator, right? So here, my comparison operator is here, here it's here, and then you look at both sides, and you, you kind of evaluate both sides. So Java is gonna evaluate the left side of my comparison operator, which is first plus second. In order to evaluate, that has to know what the values of first and second are, so it figures out what they were at that point in the program, and then it evaluates the right side, which is 30. Here again, second minus first, I evaluate the left side, I need to know the value of second, I know the value of first, do some math, evaluate the right side. I can have, you know, I can have variables on both sides. Obviously, if you're smart, you'll know, well, actually, that's not true. I was about to say the first one is never true, but it is true in one specific case where if second is 30. Okay, good. Any questions about this before we go on? So essentially, we've done step one of our ability to get programs to uh, do different things depending on data, which was we looked at ways of actually uh, making conditional statements about data, right? So now we know how to store data, and now we know how to examine whether or not data meets certain criteria. We can string, so you might think, well, how do I, let, let's say I wanna check two different things. I wanna know whether first is greater than some value and second is less than some value. So I can combine multiple comparison operators together, uh, multiple conditional expressions together, using two different logical operators. One is called AND, it's represented in Java as a double ampersand, the other is called OR, it's represented in Java as a double pipe, okay? The AND is true, well let's play with these. So the AND is true only if both of the parts of it are true. So and says, if the left part of it is true and the right part is true, the whole thing is true. Or, as its name implies, is true if either part is true. So or says, if the left part is true or the right part is true, I'm true. The whole expression is true. All right, so let's look at how this works in practice. So uh, line one of this example, again, I've got a variable named first of type int. I'm initializing it to 10. Then, now I'm starting to evaluate a more complex compound conditional expression. It's got two parts. So I've got an and here. So I know that this whole thing will only be true if both parts of it are true. So is first greater than five at this point in the program? What's the value of first? 10, is it greater than five? Yeah, great. Is first less than 10? 
First is 10, is it strictly less than 10? Okay, so I've got one true, one false, the whole statement is false, right? Gotta have two thumbs up for an and. Let's go down and look at the or, okay? So now let's do this one. Is first greater than 10 at this point in the program? What's the value of first? 10, is greater than 10? No. Is first greater than five? Yeah, so the whole statement is true. So an or, if I've got either thumbs up, this is true, this is true. And, true, false, false, false. Or, true, 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 false. Didn't that make a lot of sense? Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll keep working on it. Right, what about the last one, okay? Is first greater than 10? No, so that's false. And what's the right side? It's always false. You know, this is a silly example. You would never see this because it's like, why, right? I just get rid of that, that side, right? So the whole thing is false, okay. All right, so first one is false. Why is it false? It's false because the um, left, right side is false. The left side is true. The second one is false because the left side is false. First, it's not less than 10, it's 10. The third one is true because the right side is true. And the fourth one is false because neither the right or the left side is true. Last two are or. Let's change the value of first to something like 11. And now we'll go through here and see what happened, okay? So the first one is still false because the right side is false. First is greater than five, but 11 is not less than 10. This one is also false because this side is false. First is still not less than 10. This one is true because the left side is true. The right side can also be true, but the left side is true and that's enough to make it true. And this one is also true because the left side is true. That false is totally ignored. Remember, or either thumbs up, I'm good. So I'm not gonna, like there are like really complicated rules about how to, how to parse these. Like you, you'll find in, in particularly in badly written code, like really complicated statements that have like three, four, five different subparts and stuff like that. Um, when you're starting off, my suggestion is don't do that. Right? There's usually a simpler way to break it down into stages and make it make sense to you. Right? Also make your program easier to understand and easier to debug when something is going wrong. All right? But here are some of the basic rules about how to evaluate these when you see a bunch together. So first of all, we go from left to right when we evaluate these conditional expressions, all right? The second thing here, and this is really important, and we're gonna come back and talk about this in a second. As soon as Java knows what the answer is, it doesn't continue evaluating the expression. This is particularly important, well actually this is true with both and and or. So as soon as Java knows what the whole statement evaluates to, it stops, it doesn't even touch the other parts of the statement. If you need to make things more clear, you can group them using parentheses, and that affects the ordering. Um, but again, my suggestion here is just don't write super complex conditional statements because they'll be hard for you to understand and hard for us to help you. All right, but let's look at a couple together, just for fun, right? This is kind of like probably the worst piece of code we're gonna look at today. Let's start with line two. All right, so I've got two, so let's, we start by, let's look at the outer structure here. So I've got one statement here in parentheses, I've got another statement here in parentheses, and they're joined together by an or. So I know that in order for this whole thing to be true, one of those has to be true. But I'm gonna start from the left, okay? So I'm gonna start by looking at this guy. So is first greater than zero and less than 10? First at this point is 10. Is it greater than zero? Yes, is it less than 10? No, it's not strictly less than 10, okay? So this whole part is false, okay? Now, do I know what the result of the or statement is yet? No, because the first part was false, but it still might be true if the second part is true, okay? So let's go over here to the right. Is first equal to 10? Yes, so the whole thing is true, bingo, yeah. 
So again, just, you know, if you see one of these, slow down, break it into pieces, puzzle it out. Like, you'll, you'll get it. Um, what about this guy? So this is essentially the same thing as this one, except there's an and, okay? So this part is still false, right? What makes it false is that first is not less than 10, first is equal to 10. It's not strictly less than 10. So at this point, does Java know what the answer is? It does, because it's an and. And so if the first part of an and is false, the whole statement cannot be true. No matter what the second part is, it's false, because the first part's false. I need two thumbs up to get a true out of an and statement, and I've already got one thumbs down, so it's over. So Java won't even execute the part to the right. It will just say, I'm done, I'm out of here. I know, the, I know the result. Okay, what about this guy? All right, so I've got an and statement again, First is less than 10, is first less than 10? Nope. So do I even bother with the right-hand side? No, because it's an and statement, and so I know, the, I know the answer. All right, so true, false, false, that's what we were hoping to see. All right, ah, okay, let me, let me pause here to just take any other questions about this before we go on. I know that we ramped up the complexity pretty quickly over the past few minutes, yeah. Ah, uh, okay, so let's, let's try this. I can't remember what the actual precedence operators here are. Um, let's, see, let, let's see what happens. It's true, okay? Why? So essentially, yeah, go ahead. Bingo. Yeah, so here's what's happening. It's going from left to right. I would always suggest that you use parentheses here to make this as clear as possible, right? Because if you don't, it's easy to get confused. But here's what's happening. Java starts out saying, is first less than 10? Is first less than 10? So I get a false there. It says, okay, well, now I'm going to and that with is first equal to zero. Is first equal to zero? Also false, right? So the combination of those two is false. But... Then it keeps going to the right, and it says, oh, there's an or here. Or is first equal to 10. Is first equal to 10? It's true, right? So the whole statement becomes true. So this is essentially equivalent to, let me put in some parentheses, this. That makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, when, whenever you do this, you know, here's the thing. I'm getting old. My brain is, like, starting to fry. I've been doing this for too long. Don't make me remember that, okay? Just put some parentheses in there, like help an old guy out, right? There's a lot of ages in this field, right? I, don't, I, I need all the help I can get. Um, put pre yeah, my suggestion is don't ever link three condi compound conditional operators together. Put them in groups of two, surrounded by parentheses, so it's very, very clear what you want to happen. That'll make it easier for old people like me. All right. So now we, so we've been talking all about, up to this point, these conditional expressions. How do I combine data together using these operators to evaluate either true or false? And essentially what I'm doing is I'm querying data. I'm taking a piece of data and I'm saying, is something true about it? Is it equal to something or greater than something? Now what we're gonna look at for the first time is how do we act? on that information? How do we use that information in our program, okay? So let's just look at this. We've never seen this before. And this example introduces several new things. So I don't wanna, you know, uh, just blow through this. But let's walk through this example together and look at what's happening, okay? On line two, I see something familiar. I see a variable declaration. Uh, the variable's name is first, the type is int, and the value is 10, okay? Now, on line three, I see something familiar in here. I see a conditional expression. This is, we'll evaluate to true if first is strictly greater than 20. But what I'm seeing it as part of is this statement that I haven't seen before. So this is the basis for conditional uh, logic in Java. It's called a conditional statement. So now what I'm doing is I'm using the value of first to alter 
what my program does. So how, this is how this works. This is what's called an if-else statement. We're gonna see a lot of these over the next couple days. If-else says, if something is true, then execute one set of statements. Otherwise, execute a different set of statements. So if and else are both what are called reserved words in Java. You can't name variables if, you can't, you know, that because it's used as part of the statement. So the way an if statement works is that I have the keyword if, I have a conditional expression inside a pair of parentheses. If that's true, I'm going to execute this line of code on line four. Otherwise, the else statement means if I don't execute that line of code, then I'm going to execute the line of code here on line six, okay? I also see that inside, so there's a couple other things to see here. First of all, I see these curly braces. These create what's called a block of code, right? A block is a single set of statements that I execute together, right? So essentially the, the if statement says, if first is greater than 20, enter this block that starts on line three and ends on line five. Otherwise, enter and execute this block that starts on line five and ends on line seven. It's delimited by these curly braces. Inside the blocks, you'll also see that my code is indented it's moved over to the right by two spaces in this case. So let's see what happens when I actually run this code. I see first is not greater than 20. What happened here? I set first to 10 on line two. Line three checked whether or not first was greater than 20. That wasn't true, it was false. So I didn't enter the block that started on line three and then on line five that contained the statement first is greater than 20. Instead, I entered the block on line six and executed that piece of code. Let's try setting something first to something like 30, and now you'll see that I did something different. So the value of first in this snippet is determining what the program does. And again, like I said before, all of the ways that computers make decisions that you see on a day-to-day -day basis are all driven by this type of thing. You know, much more complicated, done with a lot more data, but this is the building block, right? If something is true based on a piece of data, do one thing. Otherwise, do something else. Okay. So again, I just set all this. If something is true, one thing, but okay. So we'll, we'll show you a more complicated version of an if thing. This is the, the basis for programmatic decision. My if statements can have multiple clauses. Right, so this is a little bit more of a complicated if statement. And here's the way this works. I start at the top. Remember, I execute my programs from top to bottom. I check whether or not this first thing is true. If that condition evaluates to true or if that variable is true, then I go into this block. If it's not true, I go on to line three and I check some other thing. If that thing is true, I enter the block with the comment on line four. Otherwise, I keep going. There, if statements allow you, it's, it's not required, it's optional, but if you put an else at the bottom, what happens is that code is run if nothing else matched. Whoa. All right, we're back. Um, so if I get to the bottom and I haven't entered any of the other if statements, then I run my else, okay? So let's look at how this works in practice. So now I've got um, an if statement where I say on line three, if this value, if the value of the variable comparison is greater than five, do one thing. If it's not greater than five, then I check on line five to see if it's greater than three, otherwise I run line six, and if neither one of those things are true, I run line eight. So let's play around with this and see what happens. Okay, so comparison is 10. What happened here? I got to the first if statement, and comparison was greater than five, and so I ran that. One thing I want you to notice, did I run the statement on line six? I never got there, right? Was comparison greater than three? It is. Only one part of the if statement is ever run. Once I enter one of the branches, or one of the arms, sometimes we call them, I never enter another one. 
So I pick one at most. Sometimes, if there's no else statement, I'll pick zero, okay? So somebody give me a different value of comparison here that you think is gonna cause this program to do something different. Let's try four. Yeah, that's a good one, okay. All right, so what happened now? I got to line three, I said, was the value of comparison greater than five? No, and so I didn't enter the block of code on line four. Instead, I went down and I, made, I did the next check. I said, is comparison greater than three? Four is greater than three, and so I entered the block of code on line six. Again, notice that I did not enter the else statement. One branch, one arm. Okay, so I'm gonna give me a different value, right? Two out of three, how do I get into that last one? Yeah, one. Yeah, there's a bunch that will get me down here. All right, so now I'm at the very bottom of the else, right? Why did I get here? Because I checked whether comparison was greater than five on line two, three, and it wasn't. And I checked whether it was greater than three on line five, and it wasn't. And so I executed the else statement, okay? There's no requirement, so let's, let's play with this a little bit more. Once I get through the conditional expression, the program keeps going. I just want to make that clear. So after I get through my if uh, statement, I just keep executing instructions. Remember, I go from top to bottom, right? So I got to the if statement, I figured out what to do based on the piece of data that I was looking at, and then I kept going, I got to line 10. And if I put a line 11, it would get executed too, right? What will happen now? Ah, okay. What happens if I get rid of the else statement? Let's see. So if there's no else statement, it's possible that my conditional statement won't execute any of the branches or any of the arms, right? Because what did I tell Java to do? I said, if comparison is greater than five, do one thing. Otherwise, if it was greater than three, do something else. But I didn't say, otherwise, always do this thing. So if there's no else statement, then it's possible that the conditional statement doesn't actually uh, enter any of the blocks, right? Or any of the branches, or any of the arms, right? So, and again, this is something to keep in mind. At most, one statement of the if runs. That's it, okay? If there is an else statement, then one and exactly one will always run, because even if none of the if matches, I'll run the else, okay? If there's no else statement, then it's possible that one statement runs, but it's also possible that zero runs, okay? But at most one. I will never enter more than one block of an if statement. This is really important to understand. All right, we're gonna skip this because we're a little bit behind. So now let's talk about what happens inside those blocks of code. The blocks of code that you enter in an if statement are just more code. Right, there's nothing magical about them. It's just another little part of your program. Inside those blocks, you can do whatever you want. You can have another if statement. So now what I'm saying is if test me is true, or if that condition evaluates to true, then I get into a block of code that starts on line two and ends on line six, and that block of code has its own conditional expression. It's another if statement, right? So if I was to, to trying to decide what would happen in this piece of code, I would need to know two things. One is, is test me true or false? And the other one is, is test me again true or false? Based on those two pieces of information, I can decide exactly how my program executes this piece of code, flows through this program, sometimes we say. Okay. So at this point, this is just a, you know, something uh, that we need to talk about. Inside those blocks, this provides our first example of something that's known as variable scope, okay? Remember we talked before about variables. I said that uh, you couldn't reuse the name of a variable except under certain conditions. And so now we need to talk a little bit more carefully about what variables are accessible when and when you can use variable, reuse variable names, okay? So a block of code is something that we're using as part of our if-else statement. It's enclosed by braces, and it can contain multiple statements. It just contains more code, all right? So there's nothing to be scared about inside a block. 
If you're inside a block of code, just ignore the rest of the program, and inside is a little program that you're running. And you can just think about it that way. Now, here's the rule about scope that's important to understand. So, if I declare a variable inside a block, once I leave that block, that variable is no longer available. However, if I, um, if, if I declare a variable outside a block and, and then enter a block, that variable is a variable inside the block. <sighs> okay, this is easiest to show. Here. All right. So what is this program doing? Line one, I'm declaring a variable called outside. It's of type int. I initialize it to five. On line two, I have a conditional expression. Now, this one I just made kind of silly. It says if true, so it's always going to enter the block. Now, again, inside my if statement is just another little program. It's another little part of my program. I'm declaring a variable there called inside on line three, and I set it to 10. Then I print the value of outside. Then I leave the block on line four. There's a curly brace at the end there that marks the end of that block of code. And then I try to print the value of inside. So let's see what happens if this code, if I try to run this code. I have an error from Java. Java is saying on line six, I can't find a variable called inside. And the reason is that I declared inside in this block of code that started on line two. But I'm trying to print it outside that block of code. So when you leave a block, any variables that were declared inside that block are gone. If I want this program to run correctly, I can get rid of this statement. Now here's one thing to notice. Inside this block, I can still access outside, right? Outside was declared, sometimes we call it in the enclosing block or the enclosing scope. So I can still access outside, but I can't access inside out the block. And I can still access inside in the block, right? You know? So now, hopefully, you're starting to see one thing, which is that here's why we're going to be so picky about indentation and about source code formatting when you guys work on the MP and when you ask us for help. Because indentation makes a big difference here in readability because it helps you determine whether or not a particular variable is visible. So in general, here's the rule. If you indent your code properly, and when you enter a block, you move it over to the right, you can access any variable that was declared to the, at the same level or to the left. You cannot access any variables that were declared to the right. So if I go back to this example here, outside was declared here, I'm inside a block, and I can access outside. So let me just quickly change this to have outside. Right? Inside was declared to the right. And so on line six, I cannot access that variable anymore. I can access variables that were declared at the same level as the code that I'm running, right? Inside was declared at the same indentation level. This is one of the reasons why source code indentation is so important. All right. Um, I'm almost done. I am done, I think. So you guys are, should be ready to take the quiz that starts today. Good luck with that. Um, so here's the thing with the homework. You guys at this point, I know that things were out of order a little bit last week, but at this point today, you guys know enough to do all the homework problems that are available for you to do. If you're struggling, ask for help on the forum, come to office hours today from 12 to 4, right? I've already noticed that the numbers are dwindling in terms of who's doing the homework. This is a critical part of staying on top of things in the class. All right, you guys have a quiz that starts today in the CBTF. This is your first real quiz. If you want to hear my tips about how to succeed on the quiz, pack up quietly. Um, here's the number one thing not to do. Don't take the quiz at 9 a.m. on Monday before class, because we will review stuff in class that's useful to you for that week's quiz, OK? If you want to ace the multiple choice questions, review the materials from the slides. That's where they're drawn from. Make sure you've read coders. The number one thing to do to practice for the programming problems is to do the homework problems. Review the past week's homework problems. All right. I have office hours today from 3 to 5. I'll see you then. We have homework problem out today. Good luck on the quiz. And office hours today from 12 to 4. I will see you guys on Wednesday.